Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Hi, my name is Stan Pons, and I'm the host of Make It Clear and the president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Thanks for listening to the daily Bible teaching on Make It Clear. From time to time, I want to bring to you Bible teachers and friends from seasons of yesterday and today who had a great influence on my life, hoping they'll add value to yours as they did mine. Well, today, our guest Bible teacher is Ed Horde. Dr. Horde is a graduate of Florida Bible College and now the senior pastor of the First Baptist Church of Zebulon, Georgia. He is also a professor of biblical and theological studies at Grace Biblical Seminary. Ed and his wife, Gigi, have three grown sons and three grandchildren. Ed has had a love for radio that has spanned more than 50 years, and he holds the FCC Highest Broadcast Engineer's License, and he's the co-owner of WKEU in Griffin, Georgia. Well, here's my guest today, Dr. Ed Hoare. Shortly after Ronald Reagan was inaugurated as the 40th president of our United States, he was astounded by the complexities of the Middle East. There was the little tiny nation of Israel surrounded by all of these rich Arab countries. And, and of course, the Arabs would like nothing more than to push uh, Israel into the Mediterranean Sea. In fact, that is in the constitution of the Palestinian people. It is to not just not recognize Israel, but to literally push them off the land into the sea. That is their goal. That is their intended and stated purpose in life. So here's Israel surrounded by all these well-armed and rich Arab enemies. And on Friday, May the 15th, 1981, President Reagan scribbled these words into his diary. Quote, sometimes I wonder if we are destined to witness Armageddon. Sometimes I wonder if we are destined to witness Armageddon. Folks, our our country is no stranger to war. Do you know that the United States has been involved in 29 different wars since we became a nation? This averages out to about one war every eight years in the history of our country. Approximately 1,314,971 troops have died for their country in these wars. 1.3 million. The Bible tells us, though, that there is yet another war to be fought on this earth. This war is called Armageddon. And it makes all the wars that America has fought to this date look like little skirmishes. This war will draw the final curtain on civilization as we know it today. The only thing that is holding this war back is the yet to occur disappearance of all true believers in Jesus Christ. The event that we studied last week known as the rapture of the church. Revelation chapter 16, verse 16 says, And they gathered together to a place that is called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Armageddon. Folks, Armageddon is not really a battle. It is a place. Given the enormous attention that this word receives, it might surprise you to learn that it only occurs one time in the Bible. In Revelation 16, verse 16, that's the only place in the Bible it's mentioned. But the word Armageddon means, if you were to translate it out of the Hebrew, it literally means mountain of slaughter. Har, the first part of the word, means mountain. Megiddo means slaughter. It is a mountain of of slaughter. Now, Megiddo is an actual geographical feature located in northern Israel. Some of you have been to Israel with me, or you may have gone with somebody else. You were taken by your guide to this mountain overlooking this valley, this huge valley that's it's almost a, a, a concave-shaped valley that stretches 200 miles from north to south, and that is the valley of Armageddon. And right beside that valley is a place, a town, a city, an ancient city that used to be called Megiddo, Megiddo. 
um, even though Armageddon is only mentioned once in the Bible, the city of Megiddo and the mountain of Megiddo has a rich biblical history. It was at Megiddo that David and Barak, two of the judges that you read about in the Old Testament, defeated the Canaanites. It was here that Gideon, another one of the judges, defeated the Midianites. King Saul, the first king of Israel, was slain in the valley of Megiddo in Armageddon. And his body was hanged on the, on the doorposts of, uh, of the city of Beit Shan. Some of you have been there and seen that city. Uh, king Josiah, one of the great kings of Israel, was slain there by invading Egyptians. Folks, I've stood at the top of Megiddo at least seven times in my life. I have overlooked that battle plain, that, that valley that stretches 200 miles. I have seen it with my own eyes. If somehow my eyes could have operated in fast forward, I would have been able to see a long succession of battles as some of the greatest armies in the world have marched across that incredible field one after another. The Crusaders, the Egyptians, the Persians, the Druze, the Greeks, the Turks, and the Arabs. Do you know that to this date, more than 200 battles have already been fought in that plain that is called Armageddon. It is an, an incredible battlefield. One day, Napoleon, the great French conqueror, was looking over that same valley, the plains of Megiddo. And this is what he said. This came out of his mouth. This is the most natural battlefield in the whole earth. The most natural battlefield in the whole earth. That may be true. And it certainly is going to be the location of the battle of Armageddon, where the world as we know it will culminate. The battle of Armageddon is going to be the greatest battle ever fought. It'll be the most decisive victory ever achieved. It'll be the greatest defeat that has ever been suffered. The armies of the entire world, we talk about World War I, we talk about World War II. The Bible says that all of the armies of the world are going to converge right there in that 200-mile plain at the Battle of Armageddon. And they're going to be on a collision course with one another. But folks, their intent and their objective is going to change when the Lord Jesus Christ appears in the sky. And instead of contending with each other, all of the armies of the world are going to turn and unite and fight against the army of heaven. Now remember, this isn't the rapture. That occurs at the beginning of the tribulation. This is what Bible scholars call the second coming, which occurs at the end of the tribulation. You see, at the rapture, Jesus comes to claim his bride. But at the second coming, he's coming to condemn all blasphemers and unbelievers. At the rapture, he's going to come in the air, but he won't come, his feet won't touch the earth. But at the second coming, he's going to come all the way to the earth. The effect of the rapture is the glorification of the saints. But at the second coming, the effect is the consummation of all sinners. So friends, at the end of the tribulation, here are the things that we're going to see happen. Number one, Jesus is coming back visibly, visibly. Take a look in your Bible at Revelation 19 and verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11. Here's what John wrote. And I saw heaven opened and behold, there was a what? A white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. That's Jesus. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. In Revelation 1, 7, here's what the Bible says. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they who pierced him shall see him, and they shall wail because of him. Even so, amen, John says in Acts Chapter 1, verse 11, Dr. Luke said, Ye men of Galilee, he was quoting the angel, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same 
Jesus, who is being taken up from you in like manner, will come again, just as you have seen him go into heaven. Folks, this is a description of a powerful event, a very public affair that everyone is aware of and afraid of. And though Jesus' second coming is very different from his first coming, they go hand in hand together. See, there is no purpose for his incarnation if it weren't for his coronation at the second coming. Why redeem a fallen man if you won't follow through and become man's ruler? I heard about a tired salesman who got in late one night many years ago to this old hotel, and and he was given a second floor room, and as he was getting undressed, he was taking his shoes off, and he let one of those shoes drop on that wooden floor, bam, and then he got to thinking, good gracious, it's late at night. I'm on the second floor. I bet there's somebody trying to sleep down below. So he took his second shoe off, and he laid it down very gently. Well, about an hour later, there came a knock at his door. And he opened the door, and there stood this fellow who had circles under his eyes, and his hair was all tousled. And he said, would you please drop the other shoe? I've been waiting for an hour. (laughs) Folks, the world is waiting for the other shoe to drop. And when it happens, we will finally be able to rest. We will finally be at home. The incarnation, that is Jesus becoming flesh at Bethlehem, has taken place. And his coronation, that is his second coming, is going to take place as well. Jesus, who came to earth as God in the flesh, is coming to earth as God in charge, the King of kings, hey, and the Lord of lords. And he's coming visibly. But secondly, Jesus is coming back, not just visibly, he's coming victoriously. His second coming is quite different from his first coming. 1 Timothy 6.15 says, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Friend, listen. When Jesus was being led away to the crucifixion, weeping women lined the pathway. And Jesus looked at them, and this is what he said. He said, don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves. This is your hour, but my hour is coming. And his hour is the second coming when he comes to judge and to rule and to reign. You see, friends, the first time Jesus came, it was a crucifixion. The second time he comes, it's going to be a coronation. The first time he came, it was to be nailed to a tree. The next time he comes, it is to sit on a throne. The first time he came, he stood before Pilate. The next time he comes, Pilate will stand before him. The first time he came, he came in shame. The next time he comes, He will come in splendor. The first time he came, he came to redeem us. The next time he comes, he is going to rule and reign over us. Amen. Amen. (laughs) Now I want you to notice his victorious nature. Look at verse 11 again. Verse 11 says that he is the faithful and true. Does your Bible use capital letters when it talks about the faithful and true? and true. It's talking about Jesus. Jesus is always going to keep his word. He is faithful. He is true. He's always going to keep his promises. When General MacArthur left the Philippines in World War II, he said, I shall what? Return. When Jesus ascended back to heaven from the Mount of Olives, the angel said, don't you stand here staring up into heaven. He will return. And as surely as a man named MacArthur will keep his promise, the Lord Jesus Christ who cannot lie is going to keep his. Notice not only his victorious nature, faithful and true, but look at his victorious name. Again in verse 16, King of kings, Lord of lords. Do you know in the book of John, the apostle John calls him the word. Jesus spoke the world into existence with a word, and he will speak the armies of the world into oblivion with a word. The world's armies come with guns and tanks and nuclear weapons, but God created all of it, and he has the power to destroy all of it. One of my favorite people is Bill Cosby. I love Bill Cosby. Not just because he's funny, but I love him because he's smart. 
I mean, you listen to that man. He has some wisdom, and, and, and he, knows how to, he knows how to get the word out. Uh, I love what Bill Cosby says about, about his kids. You know, when his kids have been dis, uh, uh, disrespectful or, or disobedient, you, you know Bill Cosby's favorite come back to them? I brought you into this world, and I can take you out. I love that. Charles, have you ever heard that? <laughs> And it didn't come from Bill Cosby, did it? <laughs> Folks, let me tell you something. God brought us into this world, and he can show take us out. He is king of kings. He is lord of lords. No earthly ruler is his match. He is greater than Caesar. He is greater than Napoleon. He is greater than Hitler. He is greater than Churchill. He's greater than Saddam Hussein. He is greater than Kim Jong-il. He is greater than Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. He is greater than Osama. And believe it or not, he's even greater than Obama. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. The Bible says in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow Every one of them, Osama bin Laden will not be able to hide from him, that chicken. Thirdly, Jesus is coming back in judgment. Boy, I tell you what, I'm glad I stopped at chicken because I I wanted to go further. Jesus is coming back in judgment. At Armageddon, hundreds of millions will remain, will, uh, uh, are going to gather, those who are remaining. And there they will um, uh, die at the word that comes out of Jesus' mouth. Revelation 14, 20 says, The blood in, in that valley is going to be as deep as a horse's bridle for 200 miles. Now, i got to tell you, I, you know, I, I'm one of these people who's a literalist. And, and that gives me trouble sometimes when I, when I look at the book of Revelation and I say, okay, I know that the book of Revelation is prophecy. I know that prophetic literature uh, has to be uh, interpreted by its symbols sometimes. But I, I just got to tell you, I just, if it doesn't shout at me, this is figurative, I take it literally. And the Bible says that the blood is going to be up to the horse's bridles. And I've always had a problem with that. I, I got to tell you, I, I must confess. You know, horses have not been used in military conflicts for a century now. And surely there will not be any horses at the Battle of Armageddon. You know, just a few days ago, I was channel surfing. I've told you about my love affair with the television. And I happened on an interesting program. Now, I don't believe I have ever watched the National Geographic Channel before. Um, I didn't know what it was. Uh, NGC. I, I've always tried to figure out what is NGC. And I was channel surfing, and it was a program that caught my attention. I've never really been too interested in in military tanks, but this show really got my attention. Military experts were talking about the fact that that the big, heavy tanks that we've been using um, are really kind of outdated. Um, they've almost become obsolete in modern warfare. In fact, this military expert said that tanks are becoming smaller, lighter, and much more maneuverable in order to be able to fight today's kind of war. Now, this military expert said that the newest design for tanks, in fact, doesn't even look like a tank at all. And then he said, we, we're probably going to have to rename the tank. And then he said, Why don't we call it a horse? And I listened carefully, and I thought I heard a trumpet warming up somewhere in the distance. Folks, I want you to look at another visual reality of the Battle of Armageddon in verses 17 through 21 of chapter 19. I want you to look at the birds, and then the beast, and then the battle. The Bible says that the blood and the carnage will be so incredible that it's going to keep scavenger birds like crows and vultures and ravens and even eagles quite busy. The Bible says they're going to gorge themselves on the carnage that takes place at that battle. Look at the beast, verses 19 and 20. 
The beast is a name given in Revelation to the Antichrist. This mysterious person figures prominently in the tribulation. The prophet Daniel tells us that the Antichrist is going to confirm a covenant with Israel for seven years. The Antichrist, who is he? He's going to be a charismatic, persuasive politician who comes on the scene just before the tribulation and who comes to power during the tribulation. Many scholars believe that he will come out of Europe that he will somehow be the head of a European Union. He's going to sign a peace treaty with Israel, guaranteeing their peace and their security for seven years. Israel is going to view this man not as an evil antichrist, but as a beneficent leader. And on the heels of this covenant, this contract, this peace treaty that he's going to sign with Israel, this self-appointed world ruler will begin to strengthen his power by performing amazing signs and wonders. Revelation says he's going to, he's going to do miracles, including even a supposed resurrection from the dead. You see, he's going to mimic everything Christ did. Jesus did miracles. The Antichrist is going to do miracles. Uh, he was a charismatic figure. Jesus was a charismatic figure. Jesus died and rose again. The Antichrist is going to die, and he's going to arise again. The Antichrist's grip on global power is not going to last long. The world is going to become increasingly discontented with this global dictator who's going to break every promise he makes. Major segments of the world are going to begin to assemble their own military forces, and they're going to rebel against him. Now look at the battle. Jesus Christ is coming to wage war. And he's not coming by himself. Many scriptures in the Bible collectively attest to the fact that Jesus is coming with an army of people. Zechariah 14 verse 5, the Bible says, Thus the Lord my God will come, and all the saints are going to be with him. In 1 Thessalonians 3.13, the Bible says the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be with all his saints. In 2 Thessalonians 1.10, the Bible says when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe. In Jude 14, the Bible says, Behold, the Lord is coming with 10,000 of his saints. Folks, all of those who have died in the Lord, along with all of those who were raptured just before the seven years of great tribulation, are going to be coming back with the Lord and participate in this battle of Armageddon to reclaim the world for the Lord Jesus Christ's rule. Both Matthew and Paul Tell us that the angels are going to be with him as well. Here's what it says in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. I wonder how many angels are going to be in his army. Well, I did some study this week. I studied a lot of passages, and uh, the Bible uses some staggering figures. In Revelation 5.11, it says, I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and get this, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's a bunch of folk. That's a bunch of angels. The New Living Translation says thousands and millions of angels. The book of Hebrews sums it up by talking about the innumerable, so many you can't number them in the joyful assembly. Angels as far as the eye can see and as far as the mind can imagine. There's an old country song, Mike, written by Roy Acuff, recorded by Hank Williams. And it tells the story of this battle. Let me share the verses with you. There's a mighty battle coming, and it's well now on its way. It'll be fought at Armageddon, and it shall be a sad, sad day. In the book of Revelation, words in chapter 16 say, There will be gathered there great armies for battle on that day. 
Turn the pages of your Bible in St. Matthew, you will see. Start with chapter 24 and read from 1 to 33. In our Savior's blessed words, he said on earth, he prophesied, for he spoke of this great battle that is coming by and by. There will be nation against nation. There will be war and rumor of war. There will be great signs in heaven, in the sun, the moon, the stars. Oh, the hearts of men shall fail them, and there will be gnashing of the teeth. Those who seek it will receive it. Mercy at the Savior's feet. Those who seek it will receive it. Mercy at the Savior's feet. My friends, the king is coming. Bill and Gloria Gaither wrote a song many years ago describing the second coming of Christ. The marketplace is empty. No more traffic in the street. All the builder's tools are silent. No more time to harvest wheat. Busy housewives cease their labor in the courtroom. No debate. Work on earth has been suspended as the king comes through the gate. Happy faces line the hallway. Those whose lives have been redeemed. Broken homes he has mended. Those from prison he has freed. Little children and the aged, hand in hand, stand all aglow. Who were crippled, broken, ruined, clad in garments, white as snow. I can hear the chariots rumble. I can see the marching throng. And the flurry of God's trumpet spells the end of sin and wrong. Regal robes are now unfolded. Heaven's grandstands all in place. Heaven's choir is now assembled. Starts to sing amazing grace. Oh, the King is coming. The King is coming. I just heard that trumpet sounding and soon his face I'll see. The king is coming. The king is coming. Praise God. He's coming for me. Amen. 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 (laughs) Folks, I love that last line in the Roy Acuff song. Those who seek it will receive it. Mercy at the Savior's feet. If you have never trusted the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the only one who can take your sins away, the only one who can give you eternal life, I want you to trust Him today. My friend, this is reality. This is not science fiction. This is not just something that I, I'm talking about just to, just to get people worked up. This is truth. This stuff is going to happen. Everything that was ever prophesied has happened up until this point. There's no reason to believe that it's not going to continue to happen just as the Bible says. And one day there's going to be a great battle. But let me tell you something. You don't have to, you don't have to witness that. Uh, you, you, you can be on the winning side. You, you can be with Jesus when he comes with the saints. And all he does is speak a word and all the armies of the world are going to just disappear. You can be on that side if you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been listening to Make It Clear, and today's special guest has been Dr. Ed Hort. He's the pastor of First Baptist Church of Zebulon, Georgia. My name is Stan Pons, and I'm your host of Make It Clear and the president of Florida Bible College. If you'd like to know more about Florida Bible College and how it can help you learn the Bible and prepare you for ministry, then please visit our website at floridabiblecollege.com. That's floridabiblecollege.com. We're also grateful for all those who support Make It Clear. It is through your prayers and financial support that we have such a local and global impact with the truth of the gospel that so clearly states that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, because of the word of God alone. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, and you want to be a part of helping us get this message out to others locally, nationally, and globally, you may send your gift to Make It Clear, Post Office Box 607901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Again, that's Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Or you can simply go to our website, makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. And use the secure donate link. And you may also request your free devotional called The Word for You Today. Well, thanks for listening today and be back next time for Make It Clear. You're
listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear. Make it clear.